Well, I hate to spoil the movie. Can I tell you about my mouse? <laughs> Mary knows my office was smelling really bad this week. A mouse died in my office. And uh, I think his name is probably Winnie. Winnie the Pooh Mouse. Remember Winnie the Pooh? He, he went to Rabbit's house and he ate a whole, a whole bowl of honey and he couldn't get out. And they sent for Christopher Robin to try to help him get out because he's too fat to make it out the door again. Well, this mouse, there were, you know, the, the exterminator had put some of the little cubes around and this mouse had eaten way too many of those. And he couldn't get back down. I finally, he was in the corner and there's a little tiny little hole that he's squeezing in to my office through that little hole. And uh, I finally found him. Uh, and uh, hopefully now it's going to dissipate. And I sprayed and I've got a, a, a thing that's supposed to clean the air. So you can visit and if it still doesn't smell good, we can go in the other room. But uh, I was praising God that I found the dead. He was so small. I mean, so, I, not, he wasn't even, you know, he was a tiny little mouth. And he stunk so bad. <laughs> Isn't that kind of like us, you know, our sin? It doesn't have to be a big sin and it still stinks. Okay, let's preach then. <laughs> see, where are we? We're in Isaiah chapter 1 tonight. Let's reason together. So I can get it in my, my phone. So. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, concerning Judah and Jerusalem, which he saw during the reign of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Listen, O heavens, and hear, O earth, for the Lord speaks. Sons I have reared and brought up, but they have revolted against me. An ox knows its owner, and a donkey its master's man manger, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Alas, sinful nation, people weighed down with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, sons who act corruptly. They have abandoned the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They have turned away from Him. Where will you be stricken again as you continue in your rebellion? The whole head is sick and the whole heart is faint. And from the sole of the foot even to the head, there is nothing sound in it. It only bruises and welts and raw wounds, not pressed out or bandaged nor softened with oil. Your land is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Your fields, strangers are devouring them in your presence. It is desolation as overthrown by strangers. The daughter of Zion is left like a shelter in a vineyard, like a watchman's hut in a cucumber field, like a besieged city. Unless the Lord of hosts had left us a few survivors, we would be like Sodom. We would be like Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What are your multiplied sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle. And I take no pleasure in the blood of bulls, lambs, or goats. When you come to appear before me, who requires of you this trampling of my courts? Bring your worthless offerings no longer. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath, the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity in the solemn assembly. I hate your new moon festivals and your appointed feasts. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. So when you spread out your hands in prayer... I will hide my eyes from you. Yes, even though you multiply prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are covered with blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from my sight. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Reprove, reprove the ruthless. 
Defend the orphan, plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. If you consent and obey, you will eat the best of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. Truly the mouth of the Lord has spoken. How the faithful city has become a harlot. She who was full of justice. Righteousness once lodged in her, but now murderers. Your silver has become dross, your drink diluted with water. Your rulers are rebels and companions of thieves. Everyone loves a bribe and chases after rewards. They do not defend the orphan, nor does the widow's plea come before them. Therefore the Lord God of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, declares, Ah, I will be relieved of my adversaries and avenge myself on my foes. I will also turn my hand against you and will smelt away your drosses with lye and will remove all your alloy. Then I will restore your judges as at the first and your counselors as at the beginning. After that, you will be called the city of righteousness, a faithful city. Zion will be redeemed with justice and her repentant ones with righteousness. But transgressors and sinners will be crushed together. And those who forsake the Lord will come to an end. Surely you will be ashamed of the oaks which you have de desired. And you will be embarrassed at the gardens which you have chosen. And you will be like an oak whose leaf fades away or as a garden that has no water. The strong man will become tender. His work also a spark. Thus they shall both burn together and there will be none to quench them. I think we better pray. Father, convict our hearts tonight, Lord, and, and speak to our hearts plainly from your word. Lord, may we reason with you and, and change our wrong thinking. Lord, may our thinking be renewed and refreshed, Father, and, and be according to your will and your way. Father, our world teaches us many things that go against your, your word and go against your will and and it's easy to fall prey to Satan's temptation. Lord, speak to us plainly and clearly so we can hear what is wrong and what is right. Divine the truth, Father, by your word. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, when Janice and I had visitors, when we were in Porto, we used to take them atop a hill on the Villanova the Gaia side of the Douro River. There's a very panoramic view of Porto there. Now actually we are on the Porto side and I'm showing you the view. See the way up there on the top? Where that round thing is? We take them up there. Hit the next picture. And look over at Porto. A prophet, like Isaiah is, in a sense, is someone who sees things from a different perspective because his vantage point is higher. Isaiah had eagle's eyes. And his book tells what he saw. His message is focused on this tiny nation in the Middle East through whom the Lord had promised to bless the entire earth. And Israel was in danger, but the Lord hadn't given up on her. Uh, there's some very striking parallels between Isaiah's day and ours. We see a world in turmoil and, and God's people who hold the key to his purposes are in disarray. Isaiah's opening chapter contains three themes that, that recur throughout his long ministry. And the first is an alarming accusation. The scene is the courtroom. The universe is called to attend. Uh, this judge is the Lord. And his people are in the dock. The charges are very serious. Somewhat of a deadly cocktail of outright rebellion and outward religion. And here in, in verses 2 through 10, we see the outright rebellion. God says with, with amazement that the, 
Even the oxen and donkeys recognize their master's voice, but his children reject. They reject his authority. Rebellion often flourishes during prosperity, and Isaiah began his ministry during the reign of Uzziah, a period of peace and prosperity when things were going good. And yet, it had been used by the rich to exploit, exploit the poor. And uh, justice was, was brought, uh, well, bought and sold, really, to the highest bidder. And, and gaps in society widened and bloodshed was common. And the people really had just kind of prostituted themselves. Look at how I put it again there in verses 21 through 23. How the faithful city has become a harlot. She who was full of justice. Righteousness once lodged in her, but now murderers. Your silver has become dross. Your drink diluted with water. Your rulers are rebels and companions of thieves. Everyone loves a bribe and chases after rewards. They do not defend the orphan, and nor does the widow's plea come before them. The crucial question for those of us who are Christians is do we live under the authority of the Lord and of His Son or not? We rebel against His authority by refusing to submit every area of our lives to His Lordship. You know, how many of us have that pet area that, well, you can, you know, I pretty much serve God, but there's this one thing, you know. Uh, God won't keep me from that. It's only a matter of time unless... Something is done about that thing that we're holding back. Uh, and uh, then our, the sons follow, follow the, the parents. The children are rebels just like the parents are. Uh, and then in, in verses 11 through 17, we see a description of outward religion. Uh, despite the rebellion, the Israelites didn't abandon religion exactly. But the Lord could no longer bear just the ritual of it, you know. Uh, those things were prescribed in the law of Moses to give outward expression to inner obedience, but the Lord would sooner they suspend their religion than indulge in this hypocrisy because they weren't really sincere. Jesus said in Revelation 3, 15 and 16, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot, I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. It's the same thing. You know, the, the Lord is serious regarding sin in his people. And, and uh, that's not, thank God, the sum of Isaiah's message. Essentially what God says here to his people in these verses is this. You're nothing in the world but a bunch of phonies. It's all you are. You come into my presence as if you're really genuine. You go through the sacrifices, but they're really meaningless to you. So God has spelled out his charge against them. They're guilty of falling away from God and his truth and just practicing a phony religion. And this has led to moral horror, really, to political anarchy in the nation. And so God has called Israel into court and has proved his charge against them. And Israel's like a prisoner standing at the bar, you know, standing up in court, uh, hearing the charges brought against them, and uh, waiting now for the sentence of judgment. But even at this late date, God is, is waiting to and, and willing to settle the, the case out of court. He says to Israel, don't go into court with me because you're definitely going to lose. You've already lost. And that's our condition today as well. We cannot win. But fortunately for us and for them, in the middle of this chapter and in the middle of our nation, we find running like a silver thread through their story and ours, a message of hope. We turn now to see this second theme, really an incredible invitation. Uh, look at verse 18, the key verse really of our text, where we get the, the title from. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, what? We can change them. We can clean them. You know, you, you're no longer going to be blood red. You're going to be white. Though they're red like crimson, they will be like wool. They will be cleansed. Uh, look here at it. the tone of this message. It's 
Its tone is one of reason rather than demand. The, the, the righteous judge is also the loving father. And in fact, his tone all along has been really a sorrowful tone, you know, about his children's sin. And, and the Son of God would later express the same anguish in Luke. Uh, what, a, what an amazing thing that God reasons with us when we stray. And how incredible that the Lord Jesus Christ knocks at the door of his lukewarm church, you know, knocks at our hearts. Uh, you'll remember the words of Jesus in Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will what? Come in and do what? Dine. I'll have fellowship. You know, you have the best fellowship when you eat. That's why us Baptists are so good at that. Amen? You, you know? I mean, you're intimate, you're, you're eating, you're relaxed. You know, I mean, let's face it, you know, we kind of <clears throat> have a little indigestion every now and again. And we're, and we're just relaxed with each other. And that's, that's what this is taught. God wants an intimate, personal relationship, not something formal, not something ritualistic. He wants us as his people. And next, as we consider verse 18 here, consider also the terms. Stepping from his bench, the judge offers the accused a full pardon. Amnesty, you could say. The word amnesty comes from the word from which we get the, the word amnesia. Amnesia. Amnesty, amnesia. It means to forget, right? You know, when God washes away your sins, he forgets them. He doesn't remember. A lot of times we... we Pray to God, God, you remember last week when I was really messing up? And he's like, no, I don't remember. Because if you if you prayed and confessed them, then he forgot them. The Bible says removed as far as the east is from the west. Right? And so you don't, don't remind him about that because that's already done. And you can forget him too and move on to stay away from that stuff. You know? Because it says we're washed whiter than snow, purer than wool. Both wool and snow are, are white by nature. And the Lord is offering to give his people a new heart and, and a new nature. Uh, neither the sacrifices of animals nor the multitude of rituals can ever pay the debt that we owe. The, the judge had to descend from his throne, become a human being, and suffer in our place. Suffer in our stead. But there's, there's a condition a change of direction is required. Repentance is the word we use. What does it say here in verses 19 and 20? If you consent and obey, you will eat the best of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, what? You'll be devoured by the sword. Truly the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So God says that he's got this secret formula, if you will. A divine alchemy. A Potent prescription, you might call it. A powerful potion. A heavenly elixir that we can take and it will take out sin. It's, it's not a secret formula like the newest bomb. No, it's really more potent than that. It's more powerful than the most powerful bomb you can come up with. In, in subsequent chapters, the Israelites refused to repent. Was that then the end of the Lord's plan for it? Well, no. The, the chapter finishes with this third theme. We'll call it a painful purification. Though they were like Sodom, he says, and Gomorrah, Judah's faith would be different. The Lord, Isaiah said, will come in judgment. But he comes in judgment for purification and not annihilation. Those who persist in doing evil would be judged through a process whereby Israel would be purged of its sin and, and refined because God wants his people, you know, and he wants them to declare his character and, and draw other people to himself. Look again at what he says here in verses 26 and 28 through 28. Then I will restore your judges as at first, and your counselors as at the beginning. After that, you will be called the city of righteousness, a faithful city. Zion will be redeemed with justice, and her repentant ones with righteousness. 
but transgressors and sinners will be crushed together, and those who forsake the Lord will come to an end. Evangelist E. Howard Cattle uh, was converted from a sinful, very sinful life through the power of Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. He, he was kind of the black sheep of his family and, and born in a Christian family. Uh, started drinking at the age of 12. He, he became addicted to alcohol and gambling and sexual adultery, uh, becoming known as the slot machine king. And, and, and much of the Midwest knew of him because of his gambling enterprises. He, he attempted to murder a man and just narrowly escaped the penitentiary in that. Uh, broken in finances and health, he finally as they say, hit the bottom and, and returned home and collapsed into his mother's arms saying, Mother, I'm tired of sin. I've broken your heart, betrayed my family, broken my marriage vows. I'd like to be saved, but I've sinned too much. His mother replied, Son, I've prayed for 12 years to hear you say what you've just said. And so she got out her Bible, turned to Isaiah 118, and in the, on that particular morning, which was March 14, 1914, Hearing these words, E. Howard Cattle was converted. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. And of course, he later became a very popular and powerful evangelist and radio preacher in his day. Speaking about conscience, E. L. Allen once said, Honestly, what use do we make of our God-given reason? I know what use I make of it. I use it chiefly to provide reasons for what I want to do without admitting it is for pursuing some personal ambition. A man may have his conscience so well disciplined and trained that instead of blazing a trail before him, it's like a pet dog which just trots obediently at his heels and never so much as barks. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness, says God's word. A preacher and an atheist barber were once walking through the city slums, said the atheist barber to the preacher, this is why I cannot believe in God, can't believe in a God of love. If God was as kind as you say, he wouldn't permit all this poverty and disease and squalor. He wouldn't allow these poor bums to be addicted to dope and other character-destroying habits. No, I can't believe in a God who permits these things. The minister was silent until the, they met a man who was especially unkempt, you know, kind of filthy. Uh, his hair was on down on his, on his uh, shoulders and, you know, had a half inch of stubble on his face and the minister said to him, you can't be a very good barber or you wouldn't permit a man like that to continue living in this neighborhood without a haircut or a shave. Barber was kind of indignant about it. He said, why blame me for that man's condition? I can't help but that he's like that. He's never come in my shop. I would fix him up and make him look like a gentleman. Well, looking with a rather penetrating glare, the minister said, then don't blame God for allowing these people to continue in their evil ways when he's constantly inviting them to come and be saved. The reason these people are slaves to sin and evil habits is that they refuse the one who died to save them and deliver them. Everything was fulfilled when Christ came to earth. He came to his own. Though they didn't receive it, the Bible says. The consequence was a judgment. And only a remnant was preserved. But God's great plan, conceived in eternity and executed in, in our times, was fulfilled as, as Gentiles were grafted into God's vine, God's people. Christians, God's word says, it, are a chosen generation a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. And God is seeking to reason with us, and the, the choice is ours. The time is now. God says to us through the prophet, come, let's reason together. In other words, let's think. 
How many times do we turn off our brains? You know? We get tired of thinking. You know, but God wants us to, to think. Think about our sin. You, you feel like, well, I, I think about it all the time and it's too much. You know, you're like the fellow who, who felt like he couldn't be saved. He's just sinned too much. But God's word says, no, you can be forgiven. You can be saved. No one can sin too much. There's only one thing you can do that, you know, that's too much, and that's rejecting the Holy Spirit. That's the only way people lose you know, the opportunity to be saved. And uh, I don't believe anyone in this room has done that. Well, we're going to sing a song here. I'm going to invite the musicians to come on up. And ask all of us to commit ourselves to the Lord. Let's stand together and commit to Him tonight as we sing. Thank you. 